Hello. Uh, this is a talk for the Kurdish Mathematics uh, School. I thank you for the honor to uh, discuss a few things about number theory. Uh, the purpose of the talk will be to see how we can use techniques from uh, essentially calculus analysis, if you want to uh, use those terms, to solve classical number theory problems. Um, the, uh, the first part of the talk will be about the uh, number theory itself, just to review what uh, it involves, what its aims are, the kind of problems it is uh, trying to tackle. And then we'll see a few things about what we mean by calculus, the techniques that are involved in uh, this subject. And then we'll see how we can use some of those techniques in order to solve difficult number theory problems on a specific classical example. So uh, number theory is uh, historically the study of integers. And I say historically because the as ever uh, since people tried using different techniques in order to solve number theory problems, some of those techniques have become part of number theory. And uh, nowadays, uh, one might think that uh, uh, the original problems are a bit in the background, but uh, we'll see that in a specific example. So, as I said, historically, it is the study of integers, meaning numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., um, or their negative counterparts. We also know that uh, zero is a difficult case. Philosophically, it took a long time to justify its existence and its uh, well-definedness. Um, and uh, already within this picture that they have, they, uh, they have some numbers uh, singled out because they are the prime numbers, two, three, five, seven, etc. Already by itself, this poses a big problem, which as we'll see later on, uh, is not easy to even define, let alone solve. Um, but there are many more problems to think about integers. The first insights for uh, uh, numbers uh, and mathematics in general were provided by the uh, people uh, of uh, Mesopotamia, the ancient peoples of Mesopotamia, uh, which as we see it is pretty much roughly the area of uh, today's uh, Kurdistan. Um, and we have even things which were written literally in stone, which are preserved in various museums around the world, where we see some difficult number theory problems, and in some cases, even ways about solving them. Let's see some of those problems, not necessarily those of the ancient times, but uh, problems which we recognize as number theory. And some of them even being classical and with various degrees of difficulty. I start with what I hinted upon before, the formula for prime numbers. So we would like to have a formula which gives us only prime numbers. Now, the, this is one of those problems that uh, in a way it has a solution, in some other senses cannot possibly have a solution, but uh, either way, it is not a problem that we can say that we have solved completely. There are some formulas with some unknown quantities, which we know that they give only prime numbers. We have some other more complicated formulas, which come even from the theory of logic that uh, tell us that they give prime numbers. Uh, but uh, already the issue of what we mean by this problem is much less simple than it looks like. Um, let's move on to another one. 
which um, uh, does have a solution and the problem which had the solution already in uh, antiquity, uh, a bit later uh, than the previous slide. Uh, it was historically assumed that it was resolved by the ancient Greeks. And the question was posed again in a typically ancient way by uh, geometric uh, language. The question was to look at all the uh, triangles, those which have a right triangle, and uh, we want to have a special condition. We would like the sides to be integers. Now we all have seen Pythagoras' theorem, and what this means uh, in formulas is uh, that we would like to know, to solve this equation in three unknowns, but in integers. So that's a, a, a typical example of number theory question, number theory equation, sometimes it has the name Diophantine, uh, where we would like to solve it specifically in integers. If we did not have this adjective integers, that would have infinitely many solutions which are not even too hard to write down. But uh, as it stands, it is a real problem to find uh, families of x, y, z, which satisfy this equality. Or equivalently, triangles, which are or tri right triangles, and whose sides are all integers namely x, y, z. But this does have a solution. And as I said, it has already been uh, settled in antiquity. Moving on, another problem from the antiquity, uh, which uh, is even more interesting in the sense that it has been resolved 30 or 40 years ago uh, using very advanced techniques but uh, it has been almost resolved in the sense that uh, it relies on a conjecture, on an unproved statement, which everyone believes, everyone is working on proving. Um, everyone uh, is confident that the holds, but it's not quite proven yet. So the, what is the problem in the classical notation? It's called the congruent number problem. Congruent numbers are integers, um, which are the areas of right triangles, again, right triangles, with three rational number sides. Let's, let's compare it with the previous question. Before, we wanted to find any right triangles which have some uh, numbers uh, which are rational as their sides. Now we, it's slightly converse this way. It's a bit upside down. It says, uh, look at all the right triangles, which have three num uh, sides, which are rational numbers, rational, not even necessarily uh, integers, uh, and see which one among them have an area which is a given integer. For example, the, I will move on to notation just to show how uh, it can be reduced to an equation. Uh, we can ask, let's take the number n equal to 23. Do there exist integers x, y, z, and t that make these two equations hold simultaneously? Um, what about the number 1 million? n is equal to 1 million. If we plug in 1 million here, can we find x, y, z, and t, which uh, make these two identities correct? More generally, find all possible integers for which we can solve those equations in x, y, z, t for unknowns uh, at the same time. And as I said, this was proved um, a few decades ago by means of very sophisticated tools, things which the people who formulated the problem would have never have dreamt of. 
because they were in antiquity, uh, but it hinges on an even more complicated statement, which is not completely proven uh, yet. And the, the final thing I want to say about this problem is that it's very much connected to the famous problem of Fermat's theorem. Uh, the, the techniques that were used to solve this congruent number problem were very handy later on when the uh, theorem by Fermat was proven by Wiles and uh, Diamond, etc. Taylor, Wiles, etc. Okay, uh, now let's move to the problem which we is goes back again to antiquity uh, to some extent. Uh, it was resolved uh, a few hundred years ago by several. Uh, by some elementary ways, but uh, we will see how we can show it in a more uh, clean way using what I call calculus, using the study of functions. So the question is, in how many ways can we write a given number n integer n as the sum of two squares? For example, can we write the number uh, five as the sum of two squares? The answer is yes, we can write as one square plus uh, two square, five. Um, and the question is, are there different ways of doing this same job? That's the question. So we would like to ideally find a formula which tells us that if you are given a number n, any number, no matter how high it is, you can even program it ideally in a computer so that you can compute the number of ways by which you can write it as the sum of two squares. Um, and as I said, we will solve the problem using techniques from calculus. That will be, let's say, our motivation for what follows from now on. Uh, before we see some examples, I would like to introduce some notation because well, this will make it handier for us to work on uh, that. Notation is important um, because uh, uh, experience shows, history actually shows that uh, this was an obstacle to people like the people of Mesopotamia or the ancient Greeks or later medieval people from advancing very quickly mathematics because they did not have this handy tool which we call uh, abstract notation. So let's see how we can introduce a notation in this case. We are given a positive number n and uh, then we want to look at the pairs of integers a and b which have the property that a square plus b square is equal to our number n. So now what we write down is we say that uh, we give a name to the number of such pairs of integers a and b. We say that the number, this notation by the way, means number of elements within the set. The set is the set of pairs which do the job for n, the job that we want to answer our question. And now we're looking at the number of elements that are contained, the number of pairs which satisfy our equality right here. And we call that by R, YR, just uh, traditional, uh, subscript two, Y2, because we look at squares of N. And so we can reformulate our question again in notation as before. Given a positive integer N, compute the number R2 of N. And let's see some examples just to get used a little bit to this notation. The first example is uh, R2 of 3. So the answer is 0 because there are no pairs of A and B such that 3 is equal to A squared plus B squared. Why? Just try to compute it. You will see that uh, this is not really possible to be done provided that we stay within integers a and b. So then we say that is zero in the sense that the, the set of solutions to this equation has zero solutions, has no solutions at all, zero. 
Another example, let's where we do have some solutions. R2 of nine. We would like to find the number of ways by which to write the number nine as the sum of two squares. And we see that they are four and um, they, we can write them down, this A and B, these pairs, the solutions. Um, it is simply three squared plus zero squared minus three squared plus zero, again, gives us nine. Now we swap the position, so the role of A and B, zero and three and zero and minus three. So we see in some sense, they're not really completely different solutions. We cheat a little bit here, but they qualify as different in the way that we set up our definition. There are four, and there are no more. Again, try, you will find no more than that. Um, and the number is, the, 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 the identity is R sub two of nine is equal to four. In this case. Let's see an example, higher example, where we have also some uh, genuinely different solutions, 25. So we are asking, uh, in a more classical language, to find the number of ways by which to write 25 as the sum of two squares. And uh, we will find, we find this case by just writing it down, writing down all the possible solutions that there are 12. So now let's see what we've got here in this set of A and Bs in uh, ways of expressing as a sum of squares. We have three and four, three square plus four square is equal to uh, five square, 25. Just check that. We have, of course, this silly kind of different solution, four and three instead of three and four same thing, but we have also a, a new uh, different solution, five and zero. Again, five square plus zero square is equal to 25 in the same way that three square plus four square is equal to 25. So it is in this sense that I claim that three, four is one solution, but then we have a genuinely different solution, five, zero. Whereas uh, four, three can be thought of as pretty much a variation of three comma four. Uh, we would like to capture all of those solutions to try to find the number of uh, solutions in the same way that we found here that we have R2 of 25. Can we find a nice formula where you plug in the number 25, nine or three, it gives you the correct right hand side. And we will see that calculus allows us to do that. So then let's see what I mean by calculus. Uh, we may have, uh, you may have seen that, but uh, I will make uh, just, uh, I will isolate the objects from calculus, the methods that we will require for the point I would like to make. So what one sees in calculus very often is functions. And they come from real life. They can express the things from physics or biology, from economics, anything. Uh, we have our formulas, f of x is equal to x squared plus one, that's a function. Uh, I leave on purpose aside issues where is X taking values in, but I will say instead what, why this can appear in real life. This F of X can be the number, the, the, the speed of a car uh, in the time X after the beginning of the journey. So, if you say f of five is f, f five square plus one, then it is as if you are saying that five minutes after we began driving, our speed was five square plus one. That could be a way to describe it. And then you could even get uh, some more conclusion, but the point is that is a machine, a function is a machine that you plug it uh, you plug in 
numbers, which may represent various things, and then you get some other quantity. Another example could be profits. Um, if I produce X number of uh, cars, my profit will be of, uh, X squared plus one dollars, something like that. Um, and uh, experimentally, we find these things that we write them down as formulas so that we can use them in the future. Another example is uh, the, there is a reason for it. I choose this one, g of x equal to e to the x. So e is a mysterious number, the so-called Euler constant. It came through uh, theoretical aspects, but it happens to appear except uh, all the time in nature, but it is for our purposes a number which does not is not rational. It is very complicated. We cannot know all of its digits. It goes on forever. It's a bit like pi or square root of two. Uh, but again, we do not know all of its properties as we know the properties of square root of two, for instance. It's called the Euler constant, but it appears everywhere, both within and outside mathematics. For example, in engineering, it appears very often, but we will see it later on. So keep that in mind, E is a number you can think of roughly 2.718, but in uh, reality, it is a more complicated number. H of X is something also familiar, you may have seen it, also very useful for uh, engineering, for uh, optics, for all kinds of things. Uh, and the, it is defined like that, the sine, trigonometric function, sine of nine times x. And we can have infinitely many examples of such functions. This is one of the main objects of calculus. Uh, how do we vis visualize them? Exceptionally important thing because it gives us an idea when we want to make applications for in real life, how certain things grow or decay or oscillate as we will call it. So we have the graphs and uh, now I arrange it by color. The blue or kind of blue uh, function corresponds to the kind of blue uh, uh, curve here. It says that uh, if you plug in some numbers here, then you get the height of that expresses the value of the outcome of the function. Uh, this is x squared plus one. For uh, the uh, brown one, which was e to the x, we see that it uh, explodes. That's a very important element. We only want a lot of growth. When something grows a lot, we say even in colloquial language, grows exponentially. And this is shown in this picture that we see that this brown line goes up, increases. Uh, on the other hand, we have the signs uh, which we, one of the first things that they tell us when we see sines or cosines, trigonometric functions, is that they, they have this wave-like thing. And that's why it is used in acoustics, in sound engineering, and uh, in electricity. Um, so in this case, we have sine of 9x, which explains why it's not really as nice wave, as symmetric wave, but it seems to be slightly going higher up than what one might have expected if we had the function sine of x. Either way, it oscillates, goes up and down. That's another behavior of growth that we would like to capture. It is expressed by trigonometric functions. Either way, graphs give us an idea of how the function progresses. Another element which we will be using and that's a difficult uh, notion, which I will describe only in a very, very rough way, is the notion of series. We all know that we can add three, four, five, as many numbers as you want. Uh, what's more problematic is whether you can add, you, you can do this addition infinitely many times. 
to do that correctly, you need uh, abstractness. It was only done finally in a way which everyone would believe that it was sound in the 19th century. Uh, but roughly, we can say a few things. Um, and I will uh, try to describe it in uh, on the example of a few series, some of which will reappear soon. The first example is the so-called trigonometric series. What it says is that we start with a meter, and then we add to that half of that meter. Um, then what we do is we add to what we already had a quarter of the original length of one meter that we had. Uh, and we keep going, always uh, cutting down by half of we had what we had previously. And now the question is, uh, what happens at the end if we keep doing that are we going to get in the end a number which is huge and uh, what we would call infinity uh, are we going to get something which does not make sense at all or uh, is it something that we can uh, uh, even compute in this very special case the answer is simple we end up getting the number two provided that we add as many uh, numbers as we can. Uh, in practice, since infinity is a difficult number to capture, what people think about is that we have really many, many, many numbers that we add, and then we approximate the outcome of our number. Uh, let me give another example, because it will be a special case of what we will be working with for the remaining of these uh, slides. So I look at my E, uh, this mysterious number, Euler's constant I mentioned before, 2.718. You can think of that as being 2.718 if you feel uh, more comfortable. And then now we uh, do something even more crazy. We raise it to a power which is not only minus something, but it involves even pi, pi 3.14 from the, again, going back to antiquity from the circles and so on and so forth. And now what uh, I would like to show as an example is something which is produced by a certain recipe, but adding infinitely many numbers. We have the number one. As a second summand, I take twice this number, which is admittedly complicated, e to the power minus two pi. We continue and we do the same thing, but now we also multiply with four, the previous exponent. Um, we do the same thing and then we multiply the original e to the minus two pi with nine. We end up with 18. We keep doing that. The pattern will be that we will multiply two with e, and then we raise it to this complicated number minus two pi n square for any n. We do that for each n, and then we add all possible numbers. And then we'll see that uh, the number we get at the end, computationally, the computer will tell us that, will be an exceptionally complicated number, which though can be approximate. It's going to be 1.00373. Why? Because the computer tells us so. And if we want, we can use, we can take as many digits of that number as we want. We can play the same game more generally, we maintain the same structure that we have here, but we make it um, a bit more complicated. Instead of having stopping at minus two pi, we can say we can say minus two pi times any real number x. X could be square root of two, or it could be two, or it could be zero. 
zero it could not be because we would end up with infinity but if it is positive number then we are guaranteed for this thing to work so we write down to summarize that one plus two times e to the minus two pi x so we fix the our positive real x in advance we say okay now my x is square root of two plus five and then i go and i compute each of those individual terms uh starting by multiplying pi with x which is square root of two i multiply with minus two i use this as the exponent of e and i multiply with two i move on I do the same thing except that instead of two i use eight i compute it again the same thing here and the, once i do that for in theory infinitely many numbers then i can get a number which will depend though on x now i said i compute this thing but now what happens in practice is that the computer does it by approximation using techniques from computational mathematics we cannot of course do that uh, by pen and paper even for a single term we can we can uh, do it in a very rough way so this is what we mean by series it is essentially sum of infinitely many real numbers but this is done in a way which is legitimate you can think of simply a huge number of um, summons that are put together the reason for which we want to see that is because we would like to see a specific function which will allow us to solve our number theory problem how do we write it down uh, as we did before and uh, I, I i will claim i claim that will show you why that this the right hand side of what we see here is the same thing as what we did in the last slide the last line of the last slide so what do we do we have one plus e to the minus two pi x one squared is one plus e to the minus two pi two squared four x so we have our eight as we did before um let's continue if we had put two times pi times three square we we'll have two times nine which gives us 18 with a minus sign and uh, the general formula is here minus two pi n square x like it was here what is the difference between the formulas we have the two so why do we have the two because as you see we go also in the infinite direction to the the left hand side direction we have one but we have also e to the minus two pi minus one square of x what is minus one square minus one square is one which is the same as this part what about minus e to the minus two pi minus two square x it is the same thing as two square minus two square is the same thing as two square minus three squared is the same thing as three squared so we have a repetition happening we can join these two numbers and to say instead of having the same number twice to say one plus two times e to the minus two pi x the same thing for this number and in general we know that this number will be equal with that one because if you square anything the minus disappears so each of those numbers except for number one appears twice and that's why it was written in a more succinct form in this way with the twos but uh, uh, this one is nice because it shows that uh, there is some kind of uh, all the integers are involved in this formula we have minus n minus n plus one minus one zero you could also write that as zero one two three etc so all integers are there 
And this now defines a function, how? We have uh, found this machine that I mentioned before. We have the x, any positive real number. Um, I substitute it in the right-hand side. I go to my computer. I compute some numbers. I saw an example. In this case, it was with one, but I ended up with a number 1.00373. And uh, then uh, I get uh, a number for each of my numbers x. This is my formula. It is not the usual formula that we could have seen before x squared plus one or sine of x, but it is a formula more complicated, contains more information. It is done, written in a way which is, may not be as satisfactory as x squared plus one, but the flip side is that we have a lot of information as we'll see later on. So the function that assigns to each x positive the right hand side of this series is called a Jacobi theta function and it is denoted by the Greek letter of theta. Um, how do we get an idea about that? We use graphs as we did before. The graph in this case, will not seem very impressive. It looks simply that it goes down very quickly, which is very, very, very important. The fact that it goes down becomes zero almost uh, instantaneously. Um, but uh, what we should uh, remember is that uh, this definition is not the full definition. It's a definition that we use for the purposes of uh, this talk where we do not want to introduce uh, too advanced material, but only what is enough to solve our number theory problem. In reality, this uh, function can be defined so that we can define it, so to speak, in two dimensions in a way which I will not uh, touch. Uh, and then we can have again a graph that it moves in two different directions and then you see that it becomes the graph is much much more interesting i will not say anything more uh, about that except for the fact that we it is possible to do it in this way the key word the hint word that would like to mention is complex numbers that's what allows us to do it in this way but uh, it uh, captures something more of the complexity of uh, that uh, function which is so fundamental for all of mathematics.